joining us here today. Um, I am here, of course, with the Queen Ayan Hirsi Ali. She's a woman who needs no introduction. Um, she is, as you all know, an amazing woman, um, a phenomenal human rights activist, author of so many books, uh, politician, founder of the Ayan Hirsi Ali Foundation that I am so proud to be working with, and um, also a research fellow with the Hoover, Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Um, and we are here today speaking with you for this program, which is part of the Ion Hersey Ali Foundation. It's called the Critical Thinking Fellowship Campus Program. And I'm also a part of this program and it's a really amazing opportunity for students and universities to get speakers to come to their campuses to talk about conversations that they, uh, the students may not necessarily have an opportunity to talk about or to hear about. Um, so we wanna thank the Searle Freedom Trust today for supporting us. Um, and I'm gonna give a little bit of a intro of who I am because I'm, you know, not everybody knows, I'm not the queen. You are the queen. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Yasmin Mohammed, and I'm the author of just one book, Unveiled, and uh, the founder of a nonprofit called Free Hearts, Free Minds. So, and it is my absolute honor, of course, to be um, in this conversation today with my absolute hero, mentor, you know, like I said, just queen of everyone, um, Ayan Hersieli. So thank you so much, Ayan, for giving me this opportunity. Um, Yasmin, thank you very much. Um, the feelings of admiration and love are completely mutual. I really wanted to applaud you for your dedication. Um, I know that you are recovering from COVID and that you are in isolation and still uh, it just testifies to how dedicated you are to this cause. Uh, so thank you very much for being here today, for having me and for those kind words. I would never miss any opportunity to hang out with you. Um, so let's start off. I'm going to start off with a question that I, I'm, I'm sure you've talked about this before, but you and I haven't talked about it. And it's this uncomfortable space that we find ourselves in right now. So obviously, blasphemy laws in Muslim majority countries restrict us from being able to speak our mind in those societies. And then in the West, the supposed free West, where, you know, we have freedom of speech, uh, supposedly, and we're finding ourselves being silenced here by, you know, rather than top down blasphemy laws, they're bottom up blasphemy laws yeah. called Islamophobia, yeah. right? So people are policing each other and silencing us. Um, and they use that word like a weapon. To, to keep us from, from speaking about our traumas and, and what we've been through. Mm -hmm. Now, although these two sides seem to look like they're on polar opposites of the political spectrum, so we're talking about those that silence us in the West and those who silence us in the Muslim world, but I'd like to talk to you about the similarities between those two groups. Do you find that they are probably more similar than they would like to admit? Um, I think I really want to start with what you just said about top-down blasphemy uh, and uh, the suppression of speech and the suppression of conscience, free thought, and the bottom-up, which is something that we're seeing in the West. So let me start first with the Islamic side. Um, when I'm an ex-Muslim, as you know, and um, I think you are an ex-Muslim too. Oh, very much so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful these days. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at the top down, it's when you as an individual, you want to pursue your dreams, your goals, that you are confronted with the top down. Yes, I mean, you can't do this because Allah says in the Quran X, Y, Z, or because the prophet has dictated that you can't do that because you are a woman or because you're gay or because as a believer, here's a list of things you should do and a list of things you may not do, you cannot do. And if you respond to that uh, with objections, then you're accused of blasphemy. And that's the top down blasphemy 
that uh, suppression of speech and of freedom is uh, not only invokes top down God and the prophet Muhammad, but as you say in the Muslim world, it's also enforced uh, through this legal framework called Sharia law. There's also the bottom up that's worked into mm -hmm. the system, into the um, Islamic, and then it's taken to the next level by the Islamists, but it's worked into uh, Islamic traditions, which is commanding right and forbidding wrong, where when you, trans you, you transgress, uh, that's a, a, a word that's used so many times in conversations um, where within Islam, you're being, uh, the law is being enforced, or Sharia law is being enforced, not by the state, not by um, organized groups, it's not top down, but it's bottom up. It starts with your own family saying, what the hell are you doing, Yasmin, putting that makeup on? Or, uh, we're, and we're talking about adults here, leaving the mm -hmm. house or trying to choose someone to marry or going about your daily affairs, things that we take for granted in the West. And not just your immediate family, but it's your neighborhood. People looking at you within your community, how you're dressed, who you're speaking to, where you're going to, and all of this is considered to be, every time you object and you say, shut up, I'm going to do my own thing, you're blaspheming. Mm -hmm. And that's enforced bottom up, and that's commanding right and forbidding wrong. Now, fast forward for those of us who fled the Islamic world and who thought we are in the free West and we are in the free West, I can tell you, uh, still, even with all the problems we have here in America and you in Canada and in Europe, uh, it is a lot freer than growing up in Saudi Arabia or Iran or Pakistan or Somalia or any of those Muslim-majority countries. We have these new movements that are promoting moral relativist, uh, postmodern uh, ideas uh, and notions. And even though top down, we have these guarantees of freedom of speech and conscience in the Western constitutions, what we are seeing now is a sort of bottom up silencing of speech. You either follow these so-called radical progressive rules and behaviors, and if you don't, you will be canceled. You will, you're, you're committing a different kind of blasphemy. Now in a context like that, organized Islamists exploit it. And they think, wow, if there's this whole intersection of minorities that are seen to be victims and that can say, that can demand that they're exempt from laws that are universal for everyone else, why wouldn't they take advantage of that? And Islamists have been doing this now for decades. They have been declaring that Yes, there's freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, equality before the law for men and women, but, you know, we are an exception on religious grounds. So using the language of freedom to actually deny other people their freedoms. In the West, where these freedoms are guaranteed, at least on paper, and often enforced by institutions, they have totally understood and exploited the bottom-up aspects of it. If people were genuinely fighting homophobia, the Islamists come along and say, but what about Islamophobia? Mm -hmm. And now there is the whole uh, organized uh, transgender. And I really make a distinction between people who are born with gender dysphoria and organizations that are creating problems um, and, and denying people the right to think critically about what these demands are, what they mean for women, what they mean for children. Again, that's bottom up and that's yes. called transphobia. And as a woman, when I respond to some of the things that I'm being asked to do, uh, allow women, uh, sorry, men in women's prisons or women's sports. And if I object to that sort of thing, you know, I have, uh, instead of being kafir, you infidel, that's what the Islamists would mm -hmm. throw at me. Uh, mm -hmm. These people would throw the word turf at me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you see how it all works. But what is admirable, of course, I hate it that that's what's being done, but it is admirable, is the extent to which organized Islamists will exploit these opportunities that they find in the West. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really like it that when you, when you 
frame it as the bottom, sorry, the top down, which usually people think about governments, states, the state enforcing laws, the state forcing you to do things. If you go to Saudi Arabia, the state will make you dress a certain way. The state will forbid you from drinking alcohol because if you do, you'll go to prison. But when you're in Western society, members of your family, members of your community can do the exact same thing. That's the bottom up aspect of it. And I think as liberals, classical liberals, we have um, engaged a lot philosophically and fundamentally with top down oppression and top down mm -hmm. suppression of speech. But we haven't quite understood how to, un you know, how to, um, um, how to resolve the bottom up, what is called these horizontal laws where one individual um, compromises the freedoms of another individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we're becoming dangerously comfortable with that too. We're becoming dangerously comfortable with suppressed speech, with, um, you know, conforming and abiding by what is expected, because we're afraid to, you know, we're afraid to get those words thrown at us. We don't want to be called an Islamophobe or a transphobe that could affect your job, that could affect your reputation, that could, you know, you, you, it could affect your relationships with your friends and family. And so people just bite their tongue. And it's come to the point now where there's, you know, the Biden administration is developing something like a, a ministry of truth where they're going <laughs> to oversee the, you know, and it's not causing quite the stink that I would have hoped it would. And we have the same thing happening in Canada with Justin Trudeau. It's yeah. to the point that critics were saying that um, that this policy that he wants to pass is similar to the kinds of things you would see in North Korea or China or Iran, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of control that he wants over speech. But nobody's, it's top down this time, but people are so comfortable with the bottom up for so long. We've become so complacent. We've become so demoralized and exhausted yeah. that even when it's coming top down, there's no response. There's no reaction. I'm really surprised at how um, these kinds of, even to think of these ideas, even to have these conversations, even for our leaders to even uh, consider these kinds of things, I find to be incredibly dangerous and incredibly terrifying. Now, just like you, um, I'm coming from an experience where I've lived under these regimes. Like I've lived under authoritarian governments. I've lived under dictatorships. And so when I start to see any kind of government overreach, it's like I, I immediately, you know, I don't have the, the luxury of somebody who doesn't know yeah. what this can lead to. You know, I, I immediately see where this could go right away. Yeah. And so I don't wanna give an inch because I know that, you know, that they're gonna take a mile. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, Yasmin, you're right in that sense. You know, when, when you have an experience, and I do, and I think a lot of people from um, free, countries that are not free, um, countries where they're used to the abuse and corruption of state power, uh, we tend to be suspicious of government and even in governments that are elected by the people, representative democracies with institutions of the rule of law, that are designed to uphold the freedoms and dignities of the citizens they serve, even then, I think you still have to have a very healthy doses of skepticism towards government. There is no such a thing as benign government. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's interesting to see uh, when you are in you know, religious, when you're faced with religious authoritarianism, or even, you know, dictatorships that are not necessarily uh, religious, they sell their op oppression as, you know, this is what God wants you to do. I I'm, mm -hmm. only, I'm only enforcing God's law, you know, who am I? You're the one who's in the wrong, you should follow the rules. Um, or it is what our government dictates, it is, we have no choice. What we're seeing in the free West is a different kind of argument where that bottom up, uh, as you describe, can lead to the top down 
simply making the best of what the bottom-up process has achieved on its own. So what, what I'm seeing right now is this elevation of emotions, of feelings. So uh, just to give you uh, an example that's unfolding right now, Elon Musk has bought Twitter. And he argues that he wants to turn that town square into a place where everyone can have free speech. And so what I'm analyzing, looking closely at, are the responses, the negative responses to Elon's initiative. And almost everything, the opponents of Elon Musk buying Twitter, almost all of it is emotional. It's going to offend someone or something. Now think about it, the First Amendment in the US and free speech is really the right to offend. It's not the right to have bad manners. It's not the right to engage in name calling. It's not the right to threaten people or incite violence. But within the law, it is the right to express your opinions and your conscience um, to criticize governments and to criticize the prevailing um, moral sentiment of the day. And for a long time, in my view, for far too long, um, in the West, we have been convinced that if that exercise offends the feelings of people, especially the feelings of minorities, then it's best to be quiet about it. Mm -hmm. Even when there are very important life and death issues to be considered. Then we have, if it makes people feel bad, then for you to insist on expressing those views or in pursuing that line of inquiry, you are engaged in offending and hurting people's feelings. So, hey, Elon Musk, you may want freedom of speech, but if minorities are going to be offended, if Islamophobia, if religious sentiment is going to be offended, uh, then you're a bad person, don't do it. And I think then what happens slowly is it's not so much that Western governments are saying, let's do away with the institutions that and, you know, enforce the rule of law. It's just that they're being presented with this amazing opportunity where they could with either the silent majority saying nothing or with the endorsement of a very loud minority, they can impose restrictions and constraints on speech and freedom. And we all sit back and do nothing about it. But here in America, I think uh, there is no more sitting back. I think there is, mm -hmm. there's been a great deal of displeasure and people have been very reluctant to hurt other people's feelings and to offend. But now things have come to a place where I think it's exploding and exploding so. in a good way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope so, because even when you're speaking about, um, you know, not wanting to offend people, people are making a choice. So, you know, recently we had a hashtag go viral where the hashtag was called let us talk, let us talk. So really it, 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 it came about because um, there was a, a medical journal in Canada that had a picture of a toddler in hijab on the cover. And then I got written to from, by a pediatric um, surgeon from Canada who grew up in Oman, was forced to wear hijab. She saw this on a toddler and she said, oh my gosh, what's going on? Yada, yada, yada. So we ended up writing this op-ed. The op-ed gets printed. And then the Muslim organizations in Canada got offended because... There was a line in there that said that the, <clears throat> excuse me that the hijab is used as a tool of oppression which is a fact i mean there's people in prison right now um people have been killed over hijab people have had their you know faces disfigured with acid i could go on and on um the fact that it said the hijab is used as a can be used as a tool of oppression offended them so much that this op-ed that they put up in order to apologize for the toddler with the hijab ended up getting mm -hmm. taken down and then they apologize to the Muslims for printing the op-ed and they just have no values. They just flip, 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 flop, flip, flopped. And so we had that hashtag, let us talk to say, let us speak. 
Yeah. Let us say what we want to say. So to go back to, to what you were saying about not wanting to offend minority groups, what they're doing there is they're making a decision. They're making a decision to say, well, these are women that have been traumatized and they want to speak about their pain. And then these are, you know, conservative Muslim fundamentalists who believe that hijab should be put on a toddler. You're making a decision, you know, because these groups are at odds. So for, for you to say, well, I'm going to allow the conservatives to have their voices heard and I'm going to silence these women that have been traumatized. I mean, we had women from Iran writing about how they were imprisoned for singing, for laughing too loud, for riding bicycles. I mean, it's the kinds of atrocities that you just can't imagine that you would be reading about in 2022. All of that is ignored. Yeah. All of us are shoved to the side. None of us matter. They don't realize how vicious that is, how cruel that is. Mm -hmm. These are people who can't speak their voice in their own countries they wouldn't even dare in their journals to write down their thoughts of the of what the, they feel about the government and they're here in america or in germany or in some other free western nation and they're being silenced by these supposed do-gooders yeah. so you know i think that when they think that we're oh we're protecting minorities you're not protecting minorities you're protecting those who traumatize people who are also minorities because there are minorities within those minorities. You don't think all of those girls that have endured FGM are trying to speak up. All of those girls who have endured child marriage aren't trying to speak up. People say, oh, we don't hear their voices. Well, you don't hear your, their voices because they're silenced on both sides. It's exhausting. Yep. Talking about your trauma is already difficult. Nobody wants to do it. You know, it's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. And then it, it's like, um, it's like rape victims. People say, oh, why didn't she say anything? Because yeah. as soon as she opens her mouth, she's going to be attacked. Yeah. And so people just swallow their traumas and it's vicious. It's cruel. Like it, it, it's, yeah. it's uh, I don't know how they don't realize how mean that is. Yeah. I think, well, you've touched on so many things, but I want to go back to um, the toddler with the hijab on the cover. Um, and then the reaction of the pediatrician who is a survivor herself of this type of oppression, who objects, who's disgusted by what is being done to the toddler and what's being advertised then uh, on that magazine. And so, that's actually a conversation. The pediatrician who is reacting is within, if you want to look at it that way, within the minority. Uh, and she is then, unlike the child, the one who has the experience, she has also the professional integrity to come out and say, I don't think this is a good thing for children in so many different ways. Um, and then I would say even from a moral perspective, putting a hijab on a toddler is sexualizing that child. Because mm -hmm. you and I know the meaning, we know what the hijab symbolizes. And the hijab symbolizes it is to cover up the aura, or what they call the shame of uh, the female body. And if you start covering toddlers up, you're already starting implicitly that you can't look at a toddler female other than to see a sexual object. And so to sexually object objectify children in that way is something that if you were to think about and consider deeply, all of us would be offended by. But here's the thing with children, children don't speak for themselves. So it's easy to oppress children. It's easy to indoctrinate children. As we're seeing here in the US, we have a huge uh, commotion going on now about what is taught in schools, what, you know, what may and may not be done. I think you may have been following what's going on in Florida, where the mm -hmm. governor of Florida introduced a law saying, I don't, you know, you can't talk to children about sexual orientation and sexuality uh, up until grade three. Now that has been in the public. The people who oppose that law have completely disfigured uh, what the law says. But you see how this fight is going on within Islamic communities, between Muslim minorities living in the West and uh, the wider majority, and then uh, essentially in response to the woke narrative and woke ideology in the West. And I think it's very interesting for me to see all these developments. You know, when, when I was objecting to the Islamists coming in and saying that they needed exemptions 
to oppress members of their community using religion as a tool, I felt that I was kind of alone. You and I in our activism were alone because here's a minority. They seem to be backward. You know, they haven't really adopted these ideas of freedom. They're going to catch up. And even if they don't catch up, you know, we ought to respect uh, their peculiarities, whatever, whatever. Mm. Now that this thing is breaking out, and we are seeing that people can actually develop narratives of oppression to silence other people that are um, ostensibly not religious, I think we can form um, we can form alliances, we can form communities that say, if we all accept that you shouldn't be doing these types of things to children, then we should rise it. I don't think that a white child should be indoctrinated into accepting that he or she is an oppressor just because in the mm -hmm. past something, uh, terrible things were done by people that they share a skin color with. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that children should be, uh, toddlers should be wearing the hijab and should be sexually symbolized or subjected to female genital mutilation or any of that. And similarly, I don't think that kids, uh, I wouldn't allow my children, my boys uh, to have conversations about sex and sexuality at school without my permission, without me knowing about it. So there's a great deal now, you see there are a great deal of problems, but I think there are also a great deal of opportunities to heterogenize the um, battlefield, so to speak, the frontier of either fighting to attain our freedoms as the, for those of us for whom these freedoms are new or the environment is new where you can actually take advantage of that and to preserve it for those people who already have it but are giving it up so willingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was happy to hear you say earlier that you feel like there's, a, you know, a positive resurgence of, you know, or not resurgence, but a positive surgence of, uh, of people finally just getting tired of being silenced, being tired of being told that they're a blankophobe if they have an opinion about something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you take a step back, because you've been doing this activism for a very long time, you started um, after 9-11 was, was your first, um, I think, foray into this world, unfortunately. Um, so that was a long time ago. And in that time, you were in Europe, you were in North America, you know, you've, you, you have a, a very broad view of how things are moving and would you say that you're feeling hopeful are you feeling optimistic are you feeling like mm -hmm. people who were asleep at the wheel for so long are waking up um or are you feeling that people are are just complacent i think i'm feeling more hopeful and i think you've seen some of the developments i've witnessed remember um about so 15 years or so ago, I was very pessimistic about anything within the Muslim community changing. I mean, I saw the individuals who were getting up and saying, look, this is insane. Let's stop these atrocities that we are deploying in the name of religion. But now, and I think part of it is because of the rise and fall of ISIS, the Islamists were able to lure people through the process of da'wah, lure mm -hmm. people who were born into Islam to come and believe in a utopia. Utopias are always sometime in the future. And I think what ISIS did was they established that utopia. And it turned out to be a gruesome nightmare. And mm -hmm. so even Muslims in Iraq and in Syria and the wider Middle East, in Africa, Muslim immigrants here to the West, I think there was a lot of head scratching about, oh, so if you, you actually succeed in establishing an Islamic state, this is what it's going to look like. People are going to be beheaded. Homosexuals are going to be thrown down tall buildings. Women are going to be turned into slaves 
it's just going to be this constant brutality that's never ending. And it's going to be this constant holy war. It's just be, being in a constant state of hostility towards your neighbors. This is a death machine. And I think a lot of Muslims woke up to, okay, this is not an imag something imagined in the future that's going to bring mm -hmm. us into Jannah or paradise. This is hell. And they didn't mm -hmm. like it. And I think uh, as a consequence of that, a lot of Muslims either silently left Islam, or if you now look at the ex-Muslim community worldwide, with the help of the internet, you can see that these are burgeoning, burgeoning numbers. But even on top of that, countries like Saudi Arabia have started a process of modernizing. I don't know where that's going to lead, but it makes me hopeful. So I'm more mm -hmm. optimistic today than I was 15 years ago, than the pre-ISIS years. And I wish I could say someone took, can take credit for all of this. But I think the greatest, ironically, the greatest credit goes to ISIS because mm -hmm. that opened up everyone's eyes to what this thing could look like. It's a monster. And to most people I know who identify as Muslims, all they can do is recoil. And then mm -hmm. out, of, out of that follows the logical, if that makes you recoil, when it's put into practice, then what about when it's in theory? What, yeah. what about what's in the Quran? What about what it is that the Prophet Muhammad, what I, we are told this is what he did in Medina, it was the glorious past. Was it really mm -hmm. that glorious? So mm. I think these conversations are happening that makes me more optimistic. It makes me also optimistic when I look at the woke and how they've overreached the response that's coming from uh, just the normal people, the way the market is responding to them, the way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people say that there is no distinction between conservatives and, um, you know, people who want to oppress other people for. And I just totally disagree. I think the pushback that the conservatives of today are giving is that we do cherish these institutions of freedom. We do cherish the legacy of the constitution, institutions that we built and so on. So that kind of pushback is happening and it's being effective. I'm also very optimistic because of the way parents are responding to the way their children are being used as tools to indoctrinate, to advance ideologies that they don't agree with. So all of this makes me optimistic. I'm a little pessimistic about uh, some of the geopolitical developments we're seeing. For instance, this war in Ukraine and mm -hmm. um, suddenly, you know, something that seemed something that seemed you know so out of whack like conversations about nuclear weapons mm -hmm. um, in the last three months um, it's becoming a serious uh, threat to to consider so that's some of the things that i'm really pessimistic about and i'm thinking i don't know i don't trust our government our u.s government to handle this right at the moment um, because of the administration we have in place and because of some of the very serious mistakes they made so far starting with Afghanistan and the withdrawal from Afghanistan that decision the decision to withdraw and the manner in which that withdrawal was handled it makes me think god I don't want these people to be handling nuclear threat that makes me pessimistic um, I don't think um, I'm looking at some of these European leaders and having lived in Europe, my experiences with European leaders, um, they do come to the table to talk about problems. And they talk and they talk and they talk. And they come to the table saying, I think it's impossible, or I think this is hard. And they leave the table saying, I think it's hard and it's impossible and it's even more complicated. So oh, no. <laughs> given these geopolitical things that we're now witnessing, I'm thinking, oh goodness. Uh, that it, it, it does give me a wake at night. But in terms of, uh, you know, is radical Islam losing hearts and minds and the hearts and minds of people born into Islam? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, again, ironically, there are more people converting to Islam in America. Um, no, no, let me put it differently. Daniel Pipes and his organization had done this research and they found that in America, about 100,000 people born into Islam leave Islam 
but about 100,000 people are converted into Islam. So I know I can see you rolling your eyes, but it's, it's, it's things like that. But that kind of thing is going to continue. But the major, major things that make me pessimistic are these geopolitical um, big deals. Yeah, I'm happy to hear you say that. And I, I completely 100% agree with you. That was my personal experience. And I know it was your personal experience as well after 9-11 just that um, the horror of knowing that you're part of this group that would do this. And so when I've had in my organization, Free Hearts, Free Minds, we've had many people contact us saying exactly what you just said, that seeing the reality of the prophet's life being lived out in real time what you know it's different it's different when you talk about it theoretically you learn about sira you know you're reading a hadith it doesn't it doesn't it's not the same as this is happening currently you know in your country or in your neighboring country so yeah it really did change a lot of hearts and minds and, and, and social, shock people yeah social media changed a lot they were making youtube videos of these brutalities they were posting these things on social media so we could see in real time precisely what they were up to and what the utopia would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember what they did to the Yazidi women. So yeah, you mm -hmm. read about, about it you know, during the prophet's time. Yes, he, uh, he and, uh, and, the, uh, and the, his followers, his the disciples, tribes. the Jewish mm -hmm. tribe, this is what they did and they enslaved the women. So that's okay. That's something that happened uh, over 1400 years ago. It's kind of historical, but now it's happening in real time mm -hmm. in Iraq mm -hmm. with the Yazidi women and they're being sold that it, it was just, it, it was so horrifying. It's too much. And it was, yeah, and, but I think in, human beings sometimes don't learn. Uh, you know how with children, like you tell them, come on, don't, don't put your hand on the stove, it's hot. But they want to put it on the stove anyway, and they learn. Now, that's mm -hmm. not, I wouldn't say that's the best teacher. We should not be learning that way. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the people who committed themselves to the project of ISIS, they showed the world that's the utopia that we're being promised. Yeah, and yeah. it ended up being a dystopia, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we have to uh, move to questions now. Um, but before we do, I just want to say thank you so much, Ayan, for having the this conversation with me today and for just being a fearless and resilient warrior over so much time I, it's i haven't been doing it for a drop in the ocean compared to you and i can't tell you how many times i want to just you know walk away and say i give up i don't care let them in you know let them love sharia let them convert to islam <laughs> let them ruin yeah. their countries let them forget freedom of speech i'm over it i'm done with them um so it's uh, it's really inspiring to that you're still doing this and that I, I'm going to stand with you always and um, hopefully be as brave as you. Um, so we're gonna move on to the questions now because we've got a lot of questions and I didn't leave us that much time, but I'll start off with uh, a woman from LA, Sigal Walder is asking us, um, as a white woman, how can she engage in this conversation and counter the moral relativist campaign that silences women who do not identify as Muslim or as people of color? So I guess, I mean, we I know, get silenced I, too, yeah. but they get silenced because they're told, oh, you're just a white woman. You don't get an opinion or, you know. Um, my response, and to Ms. Segal, my response uh, to my, myself, when people start trying to, um, you know, corner me into a skin color or a gender or some other uh, aspect of my identity is to say, why don't we just forget about these things? We don't want to empower the identity politics agenda. I don't. And so I don't, I've, I've decided, I just don't want to see other people through their skin color or gender. If you see that an injustice is being done uh, to a fellow human being, because I think that is our universal identity, the one thing we share is that we're human individuals. And mm -hmm. would I stand by and watch another human being um, treated badly, being oppressed, being hurt, if I could help it, just because that human being has a different skin color or a different gender? 
I wouldn't. I think what connects us is our humanity. So forget the skin color. If you see that things are being done in the name of it, speak up. Uh, I don't feel in any way inhibited when I see white children being told that they are uh, oppressors and, uh, and, and pushed into, uh, you know, it, it's really cruel. It's child abuse. It's not physical, but it's mental. And if I see that, I speak up about it just as loudly as I would for those girls who are submitted to female genital mutilation. When I read Abigail Schreier's book, on what is happening to young people who are so vulnerable, they don't they feel unhappy in their bodies and they are being pushed into changing uh, physically from female to male and undergoing hormonal treatment, undergoing surgery. The name of her book says it all, irreversible damage. Reading that book, I felt the same indignation as I feel when uh, I see children being uh, you know, subjected to female gender mutilation. The skin color here is irrelevant. The back, cultural background is irrelevant. I, what is relevant is our common humanity. And I think that should lead us. Beautiful. Love that. Thank you, Ayan. Um, we have a question from Leila who asks, as an ex-Muslim, is it worth the pain to come out to my family? What's your advice to someone living a double life? So this is, it's, it's a great question. And I want to say I did it all wrong. I came out guns blazing and <laughs> I put myself in a situation where I had to live and still do with threats. Um, and, uh, you know, for instance, connections between family, uh, it's not just religious or ideological. There is the parent-child relationship. Um, um, I think I did destroy it by being so... Um, you know, so angry um, and so rebellious that I didn't take any of that into account. So now as, a, as an old 50 plus woman, uh, my advice is to say, please be true to yourself. First of all, make sure that you are physically safe and that by coming out and saying, I'm no longer a Muslim, you're not risking physical violence, you could be hurt, you could be killed. You know how people, some people feel about things like that. That threat is not gone, it's still there. So you, you do really have to think very, very carefully about that. I know a lot of people who lead a double life and who, because of their physical safety, have decided to keep it to themselves. They will, of course, fraternize with other ex-Muslims um, but they do hide the fact that, they, uh, that they've left Islam from anyone who can harm them. Um, and then in terms of the family relationships, that's a very complex matter. And uh, if you're doing it just to rebel, I, I would say uh, uh, you, you might think differently about it. You might want to ease them into who you are. And I think as a movement for ex-Muslims, we're not, we may be large enough, but I don't think we are powerful enough to do an actual coming out uh, in a way that we can guarantee everyone's safety. And so that all of these things make it very, very, very difficult. Are you financially independent? Do you have an alternative network that supports you emotionally and morally and spiritually? Um, do you are you so comfortable in your skin that you can actually come out and take on the reaction that you cause and uh, so all of these are and for every individual that's going to be different but these are all considerations that you have to make but yeah. congratulations on living uh, you know living according to your conscience and what you feel mm -hmm. is moral and living in truth congratulations yes, for that yeah, I, I, um, the clinical director for my organization, Free Hearts, Free Minds, her name is Aisha Muhammad, and she gave a really good analogy for this, which um, I'd like to share now as a response to you, Layla. Um, she said that it's like if you are 
in need of surgery. You have to sort of weigh sort of what you were saying, Ion. Mm -hmm. Do you have the financial backing? Do you have a, another support system? You know, you have to think about, you have to do this risk um, determination. Is it worth me going under the knife? Is it worth me going for surgery? Um, or can I just live in my current state of, you know, discomfort? And if you find that, as I did, it was too excruciating for me to live a double life. I couldn't do it. I, I just, it was making me go crazy. Um, and so I, I said, well, I'm just going to take whatever response happens. I'll deal with it. You know, yeah. I'm going to go in for that surgery and I don't, I'm just going to have to recover. And if that, rec whatever that recovering entails, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And the thing about when you go for surgery is you will feel better afterwards because you yeah. got rid of the tumor or you yeah. got rid of the, whatever it was. And so even though it is difficult, it is, I'm not going to lie. It's difficult. And there will be a recovery period and you will lose friends and you might lose your family and you will get death threats and you will feel lonely and you will feel scared and you will feel confused. But at the end of the day, after all of that, you will feel free. Yeah. And like you said, you'll be able to live in, you know, with your own, um, according to your own values and according to your, your own happiness and not yeah. living according to somebody else's dogma or somebody else's demands. So I hope, uh, I hope Layla's listening and, uh, all right, we've got uh, a few more questions, but I don't know if we have enough time. Could, do you want to take one more question, Ayan? Yeah, or maybe you could bundle a few. Very often people have questions that are similar. Okay, well, this is a, this one is, is, is about your book, Pray, which we haven't spoken about. So I think it would be nice to, to discuss your book. Um, the, it's Ryan, Ryan is asking, um, what are some of your suggestions for addressing the immigration issues in the West to help integrate Muslims? Also, I would love to see this book made into a documentary. Yeah, it's very interesting. My book, Pray, Islam, Immigration, and the Erosion of the Rights of Women. Uh, uh, I think, so I wrote that book with Europe in mind, and clearly it is about Europe. And it is in Europe that there is this encounter between Muslim immigrants from Muslim countries and their children and Europeans. And I think the main message in the book is a lot of things have failed, but what has really failed is the process of, we call it assimilation here in America, but the process of integration, uh, the integration of Muslim immigrants into European society. And very specifically, it is the in integration into the value system, the laws, the norms, the customs. It's, it is integration into that system. So in Europe, I would say there was relative, uh, relatively speaking, a great deal of freedom and equality before the law between men and women. And there are a couple of generations in Europe who took that for granted. Now, enter the Muslim immigrants, especially the men flowing, coming in from places like Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen, you know, Iraq, uh, all of these places where they're absolutely not used to dealing with women on an equal footing. They see women just as sexual objects. And if those women have no protection, then um, they are easy prey. They are prey. Mm -hmm. And so I think, number one, Europeans as societies and as a government, if they want to have peaceful societies and continue to have peaceful societies, is to put a huge amount of effort into integrating Muslims into the, these, these norms and values. And to do that, Europeans are then required to recognize that their values are superior that there are consequences for behavior. If you engage in violent behavior against women or violence against anyone, there are consequences and those consequences need to be enforced. 
um, I happen to believe in immigration. I think immigrants need Europe and Europeans need uh, immigrants. Uh, and I don't believe in saying we're just going to have, you know, we're going to be homogenous societies. We don't want to have anyone coming in from. But in order for that immigration to be successful, it also has to be uh, possible to be able to choose who comes into the country and who gets to stay. That means thinking very mm -hmm. seriously about borders, national borders or European borders or whatever you want to call it. So it is, it's too complicated for me to say this in the last few minutes, but mm -hmm. really, really it is a clash of values and uh, Europeans need to work very hard at having their values prevail on their soil, if nowhere else. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, they have to remember their values, first of all, and then be steadfast and proud of their values and committed to maintaining and protecting their values. Yes. Completely agree. Yeah. I want to tell you that I found a note here from Leila. She says, thank you, Ayan and Yasmin, for your responses. I'm in tears. So I'm really happy oh. that, uh, that, she's, <laughs> that we were able to have support her today. Yeah. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And Ayan, of course, um, I just want to thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank you for the wonderful program that you've built with the Ayan Hersiali Foundation. You built so many programs. In fact, um, to everybody here today, I wanted to let you know that the Ayan Hersiali Foundation has a spring matching campaign right now where your gift will be matched. Ayan's organization is involved in countering FGM, countering child marriage, countering so many things that affect women. Um, and also the campus program is involved in um, advocating for free speech across campuses in the, in the US. And we are also working on uh, a coalition building, like Ayan mentioned, where we align all of our, our uh, all of our ideas and uh, support each other. And so the Ion Hersiali Foundation does so much work in so many different areas and um, they are powered by the generous donations. And so I hope that you'll take this opportunity now during the spring matching campaign to support this wonderful foundation and our queen Ion. Thank you, Ion. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you very much for hosting this, and I hope you a speedy. I, I wish you a speedy recovery. Um, too. Thank you. And the admiration is completely mutual. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank Take you, care. everyone. Yeah.